This video is brought to you by Raycon True Wireless Earbuds. Stick around to hear more about them and also a special offer they're making available through my channel. So, how about that Nintendo Direct, huh? Huh? I know, it sucked, right? Look, here's my take. That was not a great Direct, but I don't think Nintendo did us nearly as dirty as a lot of people are claiming. Fact is, there were plenty of announcements in there of cool games that we'd want to play. It was just absent the heavy hitters that everyone's been edging for these past few years. The next Metroid game, the next Zelda game, the Superman 64 Snyder Cut. It's like we all walked in with one expectation, but the reality was very different. Nintendo didn't catfish us, we catfished ourselves, and it happens to the best of us. So you just pick up the pieces of Shattered Dreams and you just keep going. So what was announced during the Direct? Well, the biggest announcement was the reveal of Splatoon 3, which exists, and Nintendo continues to insist that it's really popular, but I've never really seen that many people talking about Splatoon, so I have to trust them on that. We got Mario Golf, and that looks cool. Fall Guys is coming to Switch and to Xbox as well, by the way. Everyone got really excited with the reveal of a new Star Wars squad shooter by the name of Hunters, but then everyone got really disappointed when we learned that Zynga, the people who make all those trash Facebook games, were the developer. Then the entire internet basically pretended that Hunters never existed at all. If you thought Immortal Phoenix Rising was a bad name for a game, wait until you get a load of Project Triangle Strategy. I'm feeling like this is a translation issue, since no one who speaks English would ever combine these words in this way. Smash fans were delighted to finally finally get one of the most beloved characters in all of video games added to their roster. I'm talking, of course, about Pyra? 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 Pyra. Jokes aside, everyone's disappointed that this is another sword-wielding character, but that's not true. She is a sword character, and that is a true first for Smash. Thank you, Sakurai-sama. You have never let us down. The ultimate blue balls moment though was when Zelda franchise lead Eiji Aonuma appeared on screen set against a black background wearing a smart jacket and a cheeky smile. Our hearts aflutter, he quickly set us straight, telling us that we wouldn't be getting any Breath of the Wild 2 news. But don't worry, Nintendo will gladly sell you a slightly updated version of Skyward Sword for $60. Best show ever! Speaking of big shows, Blizzard also had their big do this week. The old digital BlizzCon was a lot more understated than people are used to, but that's because much like Nintendo, Blizzard are still some ways off releasing their next big titles. So their focus was on repackaging and reselling nostalgia to tide you over in the meantime. WoW Classic is getting the Burning Crusade expansion, which is nice since that was pretty much the golden age of WoW. Hearthstone is getting a classic mode as well for some reason. I'm not sure who was asking for that to be honest. The real nostalgia bait though was the reveal of Diablo 2 Resurrected, a graphically remastered version of Diablo 2 that looks really nice. I dumped a couple of hundred hours into Diablo 2 back in the day, so it'll be nice to get back in and see how it all holds up today. Looking to the future, Blizzard unveiled a new class for Diablo 4, the Rogue. There was also new details about Overwatch 2, which is still in development, but it won't be out this year. The team talked about the new story-driven campaign mode, the co-op PvE missions, the new talent trees, and the significant changes they are making to character designs to really give them that distinct 2.0 feel. Technical wear, kind of like technical clothing, straps, techie fabrics, more upgraded, some that were a little bit more techy than others. And making our cloth look better. We're gonna be able to make some really cool, unique silhouettes that will help them stand out from other heroes. It wouldn't be a This Week in Video Games episode without a good old fashioned Stadia beat up, so don't worry, I got you covered. This week it was revealed that Google's head of Stadia and world record holder in failing upwards, Phil Harrison, gave Stadia's development studios a strong pat on the back only one week before sacking the lot of them. In an email to staff, he wrote, quote, Stadia has made great progress building a diverse and talented team and establishing a strong lineup of Stadia exclusive games. This was, of course, all a setup for the next email he would send out, which read, quote, Psych, you're all fired. Get out. Stadia's troubles aren't lessening either. This week, it was revealed that Google is the target of a class action lawsuit. Quote, a 42-page breach of contract lawsuit has been filed in the Eastern Court District of New York against Google, Bungie, and id Software. The filing alleges unfair and deceptive trade practices concerning the advertised display quality and resolution of video games distributed by Google Stadia, and states that various executives at these three companies made false claims about most or all games running at 4K. This all relates to the fact that Google and these developers promised their games would run at 4K, which turns out was just a lie. It was just, it was just a lie. 
Most of these class action lawsuits don't go anywhere, but they're usually a pretty good indicator of public sentiment at the very least. While we're on the topic of class action lawsuits, this is one that might be relevant to you if you're one of the three people in the world that owns a PS5. Sony is being sued over the design of the PS5 DualSense controller. The controller's so good that it literally blew me away. The problem is that the analog sticks drift, just like the Nintendo Joy-Cons, just like the Xbox Elite controllers. The excellent iFixit channel did a fantastic teardown and explained the problem really clearly. Turns out all these controllers use the same component when it comes to the analog stick design. And this component has a typical use life of around 400 hours, after which point you have a more than small chance of having problems with it. Now I know some of you guys dabble in the odd video game here and there, so if you think there's any chance that you might might maybe play more than 400 hours of your PS5 over the next, say, five to eight years, then you might want to hold on to your receipt and hope that Sony are willing to replace your shit when it breaks. You know who sucks? EA. They, they suck, man. They just, they really do. They just, they do. Fresh off Warner Brothers patenting the Nemesis system, EA just locked in their own patent this week. This one would have potentially removed the wait to download new games forever. The way it works is that if you wanted to play the new FIFA 2099 or whatever, you could click a button and you would immediately start streaming it to your device so you could start playing right away. In the background, a local copy of the game would be downloading and when that's finished, you can then switch over seamlessly to the local copy. Pretty cool, huh? Guess what? EA owns this tech now. Just the same way that Namco ruined loading screen for us by patenting minigames, EA is doing their best to make sure we have to wait four days for the PSN to download our new release. Thanks, EA. By the way, EA bought Codemasters for $1.2 billion. Codemasters makes racing games like Formula One and Dirt and Grid and Project Cars. Actually, really cool games that I totally recommend, especially Dirt, which I had a lot of fun with. Racing was a pretty big gap in EA's sports-focused portfolio, so this purchase makes a lot of sense for EA's investors, but I think it's probably going to work out less well for gamers when EA somehow finds a way to put Ultimate Team into their racing games. Man, a lot of bad news today. How about some good news? Valheim. And you guys were disappointed when last week I didn't mention that it had sold a million units. Well, joke's on you, because now Valheim has sold 3 million units, and it's still sitting at 96% positive rating on Steam with over 76,000 reviews. Valheim is actually one of the most successful games of all time at this point, being among only a handful of games that have hit over 500,000 concurrent players on Steam. This is what I didn't know about Valheim. This game was made by five people. I mean, I get how Among Us was made by four people, that makes sense to me, but Valheim is a pretty big game by comparison, and five people did all of this. Anyway, they're rolling in cash now, God love them, and their success story is all the more wholesome knowing that the game is only just getting started. The whole thing isn't even out yet, it's not on consoles, it hasn't been ported to Google Stadia. The potential is it's, it's, it's huge, that the future is bright, and it's always nice to see when good games find the audience they deserve. Bungle, sorry, I mean Bungie, makers of Destiny are suiting up for a big future. They announced this week that they're building a new campus that is three times larger than their current office, and I have been to their current office, and it is big. The new real estate is to prepare for the future of Destiny, which Bungie says has many, many years ahead of it, as well as other Destiny-related projects, probably stuff like TV shows, books, and movies, stuff that expands the Destiny universe. I'm down for that so long as Lance Reddick plays Zavala, otherwise I'm out. The other reason for this expansion is that Bungie are working on a new game. They haven't revealed it yet, but it's definitely a thing that's being worked on. It's called Project Matter at the moment, and Bungie are hiring a bunch of people. It's very serious business, so keep an eye out for that in probably like 2025 or something. I don't know, it's not coming out anytime soon. And big breaking news to finish us off, Bethesda's next big thing, Starfield, it might be coming sooner than you think. Yes, Todd has been radio silent on his first new IP in over two decades, but an industry insider by the name of Nate Drake was responding to comments made by journalist Jeff Grubb that Microsoft and Bethesda might be holding a joint event in March to celebrate their merger and make announcements. Nate Drake says he has reliable information that up to the end of last year, Bethesda was targeting a 2021 release for Starfield. 
He comments that that might have changed due to COVID, but 2021 was definitely the plan. This may sound soon, but this is how Todd likes to do his announcements. Fallout 4, for example, was shown for the first time in June and released that same year a few months later. So yeah, this sort of thing would be on brand for Todd and Bethesda. Everyone is going to come at this with a healthy amount of skepticism, given how Fallout 76 went down, but we'd all be lying if we said we weren't at least a little bit interested to see what Bethesda have been working on all these years. Hopefully, we won't have to wait too much longer to find out. So what got announced or delayed? Well, well, we've already covered a whole bunch of stuff when we talked about the Nintendo Direct and BlizzCon, but there were a few small things outside of that. The first was another delay for Amazon's upcoming MMO, New World. This is the last game to be released as part of Amazon's Gen 1 effort to break into video games, following on the heels of The Grand Tour and Crucible, two games which both bombed so badly that they both had to be taken down and deleted. New World received positive feedback as part of its most recent beta, but people are still pretty nervous about this one. It was delayed to an August 31st release date and there will be a pre-order only beta available on July 20th. New World is coming exclusively to PC storefronts. We also got some news on Marvel's Avengers. It was only last week that I was like, dude, what is happening with this game? Sure enough, the developers held a War Table event and they announced that Hawkeye would be joining the roster soon. But more important, the next gen update will deploy for both PS5 and Xbox Series consoles. The update promises frame rates that aren't absolutely horrendous, which if you compare it to how the game runs on last gen consoles, is a pretty big deal. That update will be live March 18th. The last announcement was that No Man's Sky just got a companions update. Basically, you can have weird alien creatures follow you around everywhere, and you can even mount them in the totally PG rated sense of the word. The update continues No Man's Sky's long tradition of building on their game completely free of charge, probably to make up for just how bad it was at launch. This update is available now on all platforms. So what came out last week? Well, not much. Pretty much the only thing that dropped was Shattered Tale of the Forgotten King, which did not review well. It's sitting at a 66 critic score on Metacritic with only a handful of reviews up. Player 2 scored it as 75 and said of it, quote, it may not be a masterpiece, but its zeal is undeniable. The gamer was less impressed, scoring it a 50, saying, quote, it's just a so-so Souls-like that tries to stand out by having the same aesthetic as the Corpse Bride, and that's simply not enough. So what's coming out this week? Well, unlike last week, this week's pretty huge. First up, we have Persona 5 Strikers, which I have played and I thought was excellent, and the reviews were positive across the board. Word of caution though, don't play this if you haven't played Persona 5 or Royal, as this is very much a sequel and you wouldn't want to jump in here. Strikers is out on PS4 and PC and Switch on the 23rd. Roguelike Curse of the Dead Gods also hits this week. Now, yes, this does look very Hades, but that isn't necessarily a bad thing, especially considering that the early access feedback has been great. Curse of the Dead Gods is coming to all platforms on the 24th. On the 25th, Breathage, Breathage, Breathage. Breathage. God damn it. What what is what is this name? Anyway, it's coming to Steam on the 25th. I mentioned this last week. It's Subnautica in space. I'm currently playing through it, but I'm under embargo, so I can't say anything. But the Steam reviews up to this point have been very positive, 91%. So that's something to keep in mind. Nintendo fans will get their hands on Bravely Default 2, the sequel to the classically inspired JRPG. The original did very well for itself, so no reason to suspect that this will be any different. Bravely Default 2 is out on the 26th. Finally, not quite a release, but upcoming looter shooter Outriders is getting a demo on the 25th. It's available on PlayStation, Xbox, and PC, and it serves up a fair chunk of the game with all classes playable and the entire opening act. Outriders is looking pretty cool in my book, and as a Destiny fan, I'm keen to check this one out. Sort of free stuff is back, but this is a quiet week. Right now, Absolute Drift and Rage 2 are free on the Epic Store, but in just a few days, you'll be able to get your hands on Sunless Sea, the story-driven nautical exploration game that may serve as a nice palate cleanser after the craziness of Rage 2. Game Pass got its monthly update, and there's some real bangers in there. Elite Dangerous is in the mix. It might be a good time to jump in and learn it all, since there's a big expansion on the way in a few months time. Pillars of Eternity 2 Dreadfire is there, so if you fancy a few hundred hours of CRPG combat and lots of reading, then you're set. Code Vein is basically anime Dark Souls, and there's a section in your home base that's literally a hot tub where all your waifus go skinny dipping with you whenever you want, so that's a nice upgrade to the Souls-like formula. 
Finally, Dirt 5 is in there, and like I said, I had a good time with Dirt 5. I, it was fun and relaxed and chilled, and I definitely recommend checking it out if you're in the mood for some casual racing fun. One last thing, Blizzard recently announced that they are selling the Blizzard Arcade Pack, which includes the Lost Vikings, Rock and Roll Racing, and Blackthorn. Thing is, if you're on PC, you can get most of these for free already. Redditor Ek09 put together a handy post that links to the relevant parts of the Blizzard website, so you can download these games totally free and without having to set up a bad on that account. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. And ladies and gentlemen, our feel-good story for the week comes courtesy of a game developer called Very Positive, who published their game Emoji Evolution under the name Very Positive. If you were to look them up on Steam, it would have looked like this. You may have spotted by now what these guys are trying to do. They're trying to make it look like their developer and publisher name were actually the Steam Review Ratings. Cheeky, but a little too cheeky. Valve swooped in with the banhammer, removing them and their game from Steam. The developer responded to the situation on Twitter saying, quote, Valve has banned my developer account due to the review manipulations. Absolutely disagree with this accusation. Sure, buddy. We totally, totally believe you. And that has been this week in video games. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for stopping by. If you liked the video, please do give it a thumbs up as it is a huge help. Share it on social media because the algorithm loves that shit. Drop a comment below, whatever it, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Just again, just feed the algorithm. It wants comments, just give it the comments it wants. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you'll never miss a video. I will see you guys next week. This video was brought to you by Raycon True Wireless Earbuds. And if you haven't got yourself a pair of earbuds yet, then you are missing out. I've been using Raycons for nearly a year now, and I was skeptical about them at first because they're literally half the price of other earbuds. And I was like, I don't know, man, sounds kind of shady. But no, the quality was just as good or better than other earbuds I had used, and the battery life was awesome as well. Raycon's newest model, the Everyday E25 earbuds, are their best ones yet, with six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a more compact design that gives you a nice noise isolating fit. Raycons are part of my everyday now. I use them when I'm outside, when I'm stuck at home, when I'm listening to audiobooks, or just when I'm catching up on YouTube videos on my phone. They're the sort of thing that if I lost them, I would just immediately buy another set of them because I couldn't live without them. Best of all, Raycons come with a 45 day return policy, so you don't need to take my word for it. You can try them for yourself, and if you aren't happy with them, you get your money back. Easy. Raycons make a perfect holiday gift, which is great because at the moment they're running a special. It's the best price you can get all year on Raycons, but hurry as this offer is available for a limited time only. Click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com forward slash skill up to get 20% off your Raycon purchase. Thanks Raycon for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.